Okay, we are ready to start with our next speaker. If I can uh, please ask um, everyone to take their seats. We are ready to, to start. Ladies and gents, um, please we are ready to start. Thank you. Um, I think I'll just wait for the gentlemen who are topping up the water to finish, just to avoid any feedback. And then we shall start. Please, can I ask that we uh, settle down? We are ready to begin. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, good. Is it still morning? Uh, good morning um, for those of you who are coming to this session for the first time. My name is Isabella Mnisi, and I have been chairing this session um, since this morning. So, for our next session, it's going to be um, a solo presentation on innovative fund financing structures to financial institutions in Africa. And our speaker is Mr. Edmund Higginbottom. He is the Managing Director of Vedant Capital and has been focused on high development impact sectors in Africa for the last 10 years. And he raised the $100 million Vedant Capital Hybrid Fund, and, um, which is a fund investing in tech-enabled SME lenders. Prior to Vedant Capital, Edmund worked in London and in emerging markets at Balch, Bracket Investment Banks, including Morgan Stanley and Deutsche Bank, and he has over 20 years of experience in the financial services sector. Um, let's welcome on stage um, Edmund. And um, of course, if you have time left, we will be happy to take a, a couple of questions. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you will be presenting. Here's the... Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Talking about uh, a funding for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, and the extent to which these funding solutions can be generated from the banking sector, or, or whether it should be from specialized institutions, which we call inclusive financial institutions, or IFIs. Uh, do we see this sector as being well catered for by traditional banks, or do we need IFIs to fill the gap? And if so, what should those IFIs be doing? And what should we as the investment community be doing to support them as, as part of our work? So maybe just setting the scene for a moment, if you look at the GDP of the African continent, it's a little bit less than $3 trillion. Uh, if you look at emerging markets, mature emerging markets, the first world, private sector credit to the real economy or to the private sector is about 100% of GDP. If we look at Africa, it's about 30% of GDP. So that means the banking sector is providing private credit or credit to the private sector about $800 billion 
dollars. So, put it slightly differently, if the banking sector was providing as much credit, as much loans to the real economy as it should or other parts of the world are doing, then we'd have an extra 1.6 trillion of private credit to the real economy. Uh, or put that differently, that's loans to individuals, be that mortgages or car loans. And that's loans, which is what we're focused on, loans to micro-entrepreneurs and loans to SMEs. So we think the bulk of that credit gap is those segments which are very poorly covered. And why does that matter? Well, we see micro-entrepreneurs and SMEs as the engine of growth in the African economy. We don't see the public sector as growing. Uh, we don't see uh, the resources sector, oils and mining, while that can contribute to towards GDP. We see that as a, having a limited impact on domestic employment and domestic livelihoods. So we see micro entrepreneurs and we see SMEs as critical in driving the development agenda. What we've seen in the last 10 years, the last 15 years, is very significant changes in technology in the financial sector. So we've seen, I call that the ecosystem, I call that the rails. So mobile wallets, mobile money, how data is aggregated, how data is handled and analyzed. And that's the ecosystem on which creates a very significant opportunity to intermediate for, for, for lenders on the ground to create loans to small businesses, to micro entrepreneurs, to other types of small, small borrowers. And that opportunity realistically didn't in, exist 15 years ago. So what we see is an opportunity for the best financial companies, the best credit businesses, the best microfinance businesses, the best IFIs to use those rails, use that ecosystem to close at least part of that credit gap. Um, and that's what we call the, the, call the IFIs. So what's absolutely striking is there is a chasm in terms of performance between the top quartile and the bottom quartile. And, and these numbers are slightly misleading because it is looking at the COVID period. And what we see, leaving aside the COVID period, we see the top IFIs doing a return on equity of 30 to 40 percent. We see the bottom quartile of IFIs doing a return on equity that's negative. They're making losses. There's a, a big, big difference in financial performance. Why is that important? Well, if this sector is to grow, if this sector is to extend more credit to the real economy, to micro entrepreneurs, SMEs, the business, these businesses need to be profitable in their own right. They need to be profitable so that they can grow. And, uh, and that's one of the key challenges for us as the investor community to sift out between the bottom quartile, the third quartile, the second quartile, and the top quartile. Microfinance it's not, it's not a term that people use very much, or it's a term that's a little bit going out of fashion in terms of the financial community. Um, a lot of challenges in terms of traditional microfinance, these are businesses who are providing uh, capital to micro entrepreneurs, SMEs in the continent, but perhaps, uh, perhaps using more traditional types of funding methodology. Uh, you know, a lot of these businesses are characterized by expensive processes, whether that's cash handling. Cash handling is very, very expensive, or, or paper-based systems, or they've got expensive branch infrastructure, which is neither convenient nor efficient, convenient for the customer or efficient. So what we've seen over the last five to seven years is a community of successful businesses which have really built up or grown up on those rails or on that new tech ecosystem which has evolved over the last 15 years. And these companies are leveraging that technology to do business differently and more profitably and more successfully. And we call these businesses the digital natives. So getting cash out of the loan cycle. So you don't extend credit in a loan. Uh, in cash, you extend credit with mobile money or mobile payment. Remember, most of these customers don't have bank accounts. Um, you have a, a life cycle of your loan that's 100% digital. There's no paper-based application. And ultimately, you use data to credit score. 
So you have a credit scoring system where you have pass or fail, but it's a score system. You can change your underwriting criteria, create your the minimum score to originate a new loan or size uh, as the market goes up and down. So maybe we're going to touch on a few specific examples. Closed loop working capital financing. So this is how we describe lenders who've got control over one end or other of the working capital cycle and they use that to originate credit in a risk adjusted way. They use that to have some control over their borrowers and they use that to aggregate data regarding their prospective borrowers. So great examples of that would be uh, someone like a retail capital in South Africa which was bought by Time Bank an US Plus in South Africa, uh, uh, someone like a Flow in Uganda, which is doing financing to small merchants, or somebody like a 4G Capital in, uh, in Kenya. And you know, we see these businesses 100% digital, so loans made by mobile money straight to the mobile wallet, repayments directly from the same place. The whole credit cycle is is digital, so no, no paper. And uh, you know, much stronger credit scoring and in many places risk-based pricing. Another segment we like is asset, asset financing backed by tracking technologies. So um, financing assets which small business people and micro entrepreneurs need for their careers. So if they're a taxi driver, if it's in East Africa, they can get a bottle bottle loan if they're in if they're in southern Africa, they can get a taxi, a taxi loan to buy a minibus taxi, and they can make a living every day. And this is backed by technology, so the vehicles can't, can't disappear. And you know, if you, don't, if you don't, uh, don't pay your loan on time, you get a knock on your door, and somebody's telling you to take your bike back, which you don't want. And again, using very similar um, complementary systems, everything, everything's done that's no cash. You get physical possession of the vehicle. It's not a, you know, you don't get a loan, which you can, Use, you can use that loan as a micro entrepreneur for something that you're not telling your, your, your friendly MFI why you're using it, but the, the, whole, the asset is dispersed. And again, it's using uh, uh, the, 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 the risk-based pricing. One of the questions we often get when we look at winners versus losers is, are you better off being a digital native business which uh, which was started or built uh, on that new ecosystem, on those new rails, um, which has a lot of advantages because you don't have legacy infrastructure, you don't have legacy costs, or are you better being an established regulated business that can take deposits and then try and transform your business model uh, by getting rid of the paper, getting rid of expensive assets, and uh, and digitalizing your business. So there's clearly pros and cons and advantages each way, but predominantly we see the digital native businesses being more represented in the top quartile of performers than the, what we call the transformers. The transformers is what we call the more traditional businesses who are changing their business model. Is, is consolidation a driver of performance? for the IFI sector, uh, for the microfinance sector. So we definitely think that consolidation has a role to play in increasing the overall financial performance of microfinance under IFIs. We, and we think that is uh, important. One, one case study I would quickly give on that is the contrast between India on one hand and, Afri uh, and Africa on the other. So, Population of India and Africa is the same. The aggregate GDP of the whole of Africa is about the same as India. But if you look at Africa, we've got 54 countries. If we look at India, we've got one country. So much easier for financial companies, in fact, any company, it's much easier for financial companies to access capital, grow, because you're never crossing national borders. Uh, so yes, within Africa, we have lots of clients, lots of partners who have successfully expanded from one country to the next. They replicate their infrastructure, their compliance, got new licenses, have gone into a new country. But clearly that's much harder 
than if there aren't borders. And you know, one, one sort of snapshot of what I mean by harder is if you look at the last 10 years, there's been $5 billion in the IPO market raised by IFIs in India, 10 times as much as, um, as, in, as in Africa. So consolidation in country versus cross border, we believe there's a lot of synergies and advantages to both, but there's more advantages obviously in country. Great example in country, retail capital being acquired by Time Bank, um, cross border, um, our firm advised Lesaho or advised AFB on their sale to Lesaho in Ghana. So, uh, you know, yes, definitely uh, more, more synergies in country, but there's only so many good businesses in your own country, so cross border MA has a role to play as well. FinTech boom, is the FinTech boom over? Uh, well, I, I guess the uh, short answer is no. Uh, you know, headline from PitchBook last week, Africa's fintech market defies a VC downturn. So our, our sense on this is yes, venture investing in Africa, yes, fintech investing in Africa is weaker than last year, but it's proven a lot more resilient than the rest of the world. And that's largely because of fundamental reasons. Uh, you know, our financial sector in Africa is much more needed disruption than the financial sector in Western Europe and the UK, UK and, and US where where the services are much better. Very quickly in our fund, $100 million final close fund, we're investing hybrid equity and subordinated debt into tech-enabled, best-in-class uh, microfinance MSME lenders. We're not investing in startups or fintechs, but we are investing in those businesses who've proven their, um, uh, proven their business model, proven their, their credit portfolios. Uh, but really focus on those who have that knock-on impact on uh, knock-on impact through making loans to micro entrepreneurs and to SMEs, uh, and really looking to build a, a, a more vibrant, dynamic African economy uh, yeah, through that through that transition mechanism. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Uh, a gentleman at the back. Sorry. Yes. All right. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I think um, it gives a good um, overview of what is going on. I think one of the things that uh, most of the international funders would like to understand are what are the appropriate instruments to invest in financial inclusion in Africa? Right, um, and right now, that's the question that we're facing because, of course, on the debt end side, it's getting very, very challenging for cross-border investment on the debt side. So if you look at financial um, institutions in Africa, what type of instruments do you think will actually aid them from the international perspective? Thanks. Th thank you, Stanley. I think as a whole, th the market is short equity and equity-like instruments. And, and I think that's a challenge as a community as to how do we um, set up structures which can be a conduit for equity or hybrid equity type capital to get into to MFIs. I think that does make it easier from a, uh, you know, managing a lot of risks, whether that's capitalization risk, balance sheet risk, whether that's managing FX risk. And ultimately, and if we look at Verdant Capital's 10 years, 10 year history, working in microfinance, inclusive finance, what we see is the amount of leverage in the sector going up every year. We see the microfinance banks and the credit businesses getting more and more leveraged every year. And that's a good thing. It means they're making more loans to micro entrepreneurs and SMEs. But what it also means is the amount of equity in those businesses hasn't kept up. And our fund is looking to, in its own small way, to contribute towards greater capitalization of the microfinance banks and IFIs. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, yes, I can. I'm just trying to move, move backwards to that slide, but it won't. Okay. There we go. 
Yes, but for the rest of the audience, my question was around the financing tracking technologies. So you use the example of car assets or, or um, motorbikes, something like that. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in, um, in agricultural, agricultural lending and tracking of uh, equipment, mechanization, and whether that's an area of growth or have there been challenges around tracking in other, in other examples that you've seen? So we, um, maybe just mention your name and your institution. I'm sorry, my name is Alexandra Spieldock and I'm with Bounty Field International, which specializes in post-harvest technology solutions for smallholder markets. Thank you very much for the question. So we see that tracked asset finance as being an attractive conduit to get credit to the agricultural sector. We think it's probably the easiest way of getting credit to the agricultural sector. It's not dependent on necessarily a, a, the traditional seasonal cycle, uh, uh, how, how well your crops grow, being able to repay you know, security on that, on that working capital. It's not dependent on land, and land can be very difficult to get title deeds over, particularly in rural parts of the continent. So it is the cleanest um, way of getting funding to the agri-sector. If we look at the businesses which I'm aware of who do equipment financing through a similar methodology to these players, to the agri-sector, they are smaller. And the reason they're smaller is they've got a smaller addressable market than, uh, well, I, I think they've got a smaller addressable market, but you, know, you, might, you might query that because the agricultural sector is, is very significant. Um, but these, these business models have been successful because they've standardized their product and that's enabled them to grow scale at an affordable price. And the you know, challenge for the agri equipment financiers is to build similar scale and then get similar access to capital. And you know, you know, query why that's not been possible, is, is there fewer opportunities to create credit? Uh, do, does one need to look at sharing of equipment between different farmers, which adds a different layers of complexity? Do we need to look at a different business model? Would it be easier if we could set up a business in five different countries at the same time without having five different licenses? Coming back to the point, the contra contrast of India. I'm sorry, I don't think I've answered the question very well, but it's a very interesting question. A gentleman at the back. Okay. Thank you very much. Wapilo uh, from Botswana, Tikano Group. Yeah, so I think one of the things that we have observed uh, is that uh, a lot of the funds don't have appetite for uh, companies in Africa who don't have uh, much equity because they always want to do uh, equity-linked uh, investments. Yeah. So we find that uh, there are lots of people who work in the banks. I I'll talk about myself, worked for FNB, Standard Chartered Bank, uh, and Stambik Bank. So all those are big portfolios that I held. But then when you try to raise capital, you always uh, don't get through the line because of the, the balance sheet issue. But I believe that if you can look into uh, the strength of the transaction, the strength of the management, uh, the risk mitigants that the company has put in place, not necessarily the balance sheet, that will be a transformative approach to Africa. Uh, that's why now you'll see a lot of people uh, empowering uh, others because of their the strength and the strength of the, the structuring. Thank you. I 100% agree with the premise behind your question. A lot of senior lenders in the wholesale market funding financial businesses such as yours, it's very much rules-based. And then you've got a rule for NPLs, you've got a rule for minimum capital, you've got a rule for balance sheet size. You kind of tick all those boxes then 99% you're going to get, get the loan. <laughs> um, you've been operating three years as another rule. So you kind of you tick those rules. And what we've seen over the last five years is very interesting is the emergence of new funds which aren't handcuffed to, to those specific rules. And they have more discretion, more flexibility. They can do bigger loans versus the amount of equity capital. And I think that's very, very important. We'd like to think that Verdant Capital Hybrid Fund is one of those um, investors have more flexibility and have a, have a more fundamental approach than a rules-based approach. 
and, uh, but it's, I would say it's probably 10% of the investment community, maybe fractionally less. Thank you very much indeed for being our MC. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Edmund, for a very uh, interactive and uh, interesting conversation. Um, I think this is the, the end of the first, the morning session of the investing, and uh, I will then, this is the end of my, my chairing role. I think I will then hand over to the next chair. I'm not sure if the next chair is here or if there's a break in between. The, I think there's a tea break. Yeah, there's a tea break or comfort break. Uh, for now, we'll see you guys later. Thank you. <laughs>